turn in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians 5, that's where we'll be spending most of our time this morning. What are you looking forward to right now? It seems to me that there's always something on the forefront of my mind uh, that I'm looking forward to. Maybe for you, you're looking forward to a birthday or an anniversary coming up soon. Maybe there's a package being delivered to your house and you've been following the tracking number on your phone or computer. I know I do that a lot. Uh, perhaps you're looking forward to your favorite baseball team's next game. Uh, maybe you have a trip or vacation planned uh, that you're particularly excited about. Or it could be that you're just ready for this year to end. When we read the letters written by Paul to the church in Thessalonica, we read a lot about the day of the Lord, the return of Jesus, or what we commonly think of as the end of the world. And why is that? It's because the Thessalonians, the Christians in Thessalon Thessalonica, they themselves were laser focused on the return of Christ. The Thessalonians were eager for Jesus's return. Uh, and this was good news to Paul because it meant that they were faithful to the things he had taught them. What the Thessalonians thought about the day of the Lord directed the way they lived their lives. And throughout the book of 1 Thessalonians, Paul commends these Christians for the way they lived. Let's read just a few spots in 1 Thessalonians. Start with me in chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. Paul wrote, We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly, mentioning you in our prayers, rem remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. In chapter 3, he writes about the encouraging report Timothy brought back about the things going on in Thessalonica. In chapter 4, read with me verse 1. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. Here, Paul is not criticizing or condemning the Thessalonians. He's saying, keep doing what you are doing. You are doing the right thing. Do it more and more. In verse 9, Paul wrote, Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. The Thessalonians loved one another, and Paul said, That is great. Keep doing that more and more. Now, the Thessalonians, at the time Paul wrote this letter, they were doing great, but they were a little bit confused. They were ready for Jesus to come back. That's where their mind was. That's what they were thinking about. That's what they were looking forward to. Uh, but they didn't understand the return of Jesus completely. If you look at the end of chapter 4, uh, we read, They were afraid that their brothers and sisters who had passed away were going to miss out on the return of Jesus. They didn't understand it. Uh, they thought they were pretty certain uh, that he was going to come pretty soon, and they weren't privy to the information and that we'd make it several thousand years before he returned. So they thought their brothers and sisters passed away would miss out on the return of Jesus. They were looking forward to the day of the Lord, but they didn't understand it completely. So Paul helps them understand in 1 Thessalonians 4, read with me verses 13 to 18. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. This is what the return of Jesus will look like. And this would have been especially encouraging to the Thessalonians. Paul's description would have uh, 
filled the Thessalonians with even more excitement for the return of Jesus. They were already looking forward to it, but knowing that their dead brothers and sisters would be raised and join them in the air with the Lord, uh, that was something to keep them going even more and more. And this is what Christians have continued to believe and anticipate for over 2,000 years. And as we looked at Paul repeats over and over again to the Thessalonians, they were living right. He encouraged them to keep looking forward to Jesus' return and to keep living like they were looking forward to Jesus' return. Is the return of Christ, the day of the Lord, something you often think about? Are you excited and ready for the day of the Lord? Or does it give you a feeling of dread? Maybe third option, you just don't think about it that much. If you feel either dread or nothing at all about the return of Jesus, what does that say about your faith? What do you think about the return of Jesus? And more importantly, how does that impact how you live? Studying the Thessalonians, we see uh, that they lived looking forward to Jesus' return. The Thessalonians lived looking forward to the Lord's return. Since Paul encouraged them to keep living how they were living, that signals to us we should want to be like them. There's something special there. That's the kind of faith that makes the day of the Lord something to look forward to, not something to dread or dismiss. You and I must live looking forward to Jesus' return. And what does that mean practically for us? Read with me what Paul said the Thessalonians were doing right in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and let's commit to doing these things together. We're going to study the first 11 verses, but right now let's just read through verses 1 through 4. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 4. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come, up, come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. The first thing we must do as Christians to live looking forward to Jesus' return is to be aware. Be aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Paul wrote to the Thessalonians in verse 2, he said specifically, you yourselves are fully aware. If you're reading from the King James Version, it says, you yourselves know perfectly. The Thessalonian Christians, they knew that they couldn't predict when Jesus would return. They just knew that he would return. And this is a concept that these Christians had down pat. They didn't need correcting. They didn't need convincing. Their full awareness of the times and seasons of Christ's return determined how they lived. And Paul uses here in these verses two ideas to illustrate the time of Jesus's return. The day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, and as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman. Jesus will return when people are least expecting it. His return is going to catch people off guard. The imagery of a thief in the night here is not unique to Paul. We see it throughout the New Testament, uh, and the Lord himself used the same illustration decades earlier. If you would, keep 1 Thessalonians 5 marked and turn to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. And read with me verse 36. Jesus said, But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. Skip down with me to verse 42. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you don't expect. Have you ever had something stolen from you by a thief? 
In the summer of 2018, I traveled with a youth group to Minnesota, and we went to the Mall of America, and we had a great time there. But at the end of the day, I realized my phone wasn't in my pocket anymore. So I retraced my steps throughout the mall. I looked everywhere I could, but my phone uh, was nowhere to be found. And one of the kids in the youth group, he pulled out his phone and tried to track mine. And when he pulled it up on the map, you could see my phone moving across the mall, independent of me. I'd been pickpocketed. Less than a week later, our same group was at the city museum in St. Louis. And we had a great time there too. We parked our bus in the parking lot of Emo's Pizza, right across the road from the city museum. And I don't recommend you ever park there because when we came back, our bus had been broken into and most of our things were stolen. In both situations, the first one when my phone was pickpocketed, the second one when our youth group's bus was broken into, we didn't expect to have any of our things stolen. We were caught by surprise. Maybe you have stories of your own you could relate to this illustration with. Do you know that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night? Or do you try not to think about it? Living, looking forward to Jesus' return means we must be fully aware that he will come like a thief. We must be fully aware that he'll come like a thief. And reflecting on that 2018 trip to Minnesota and to St. Louis, do you think if we knew that a thief was coming around, we would have parked our bus in the same place? Of course not. We wouldn't have let our bus be broken into. And Jesus said in Matthew 24, something along the same lines, if the master of the house had not known in what part of the night, if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. If you know the Lord is coming like a thief, are you going to do something? Jesus told his disciples this would happen. And he said, therefore, stay awake. Paul reminded the Thessalonians that they were fully aware the day of the Lord would come like a thief. And he encouraged them with the same words Jesus did to encourage his disciples. So then, let us not sleep as others do. Let us keep awake. In essence, both Paul and Jesus were saying this. Because you are fully aware of this truth, this is what you need to do. Keep awake. The second thing we have to do to live looking forward to Christ's return is to be awake. Be awake so that day will not surprise you. Read with me back in 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 4 through 7. 1 Thessalonians 5, starting in verse 4. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness, so then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. Since the day of the Lord is coming like a thief, be awake. And Paul wrote about the Christians, you are not in darkness for that day to surprise you like a thief. Those who aren't in Christ those who don't anticipate his return, they're spiritually asleep. So when that day comes, sudden destruction will come upon them. They're going to be surprised. But Christians are aware and anticipate the return of Christ. They're spiritually awake. Paul says in verse 4, that day will not surprise you like a thief. Christians won't be surprised when Jesus comes back. We're expecting his return. We know Jesus is coming soon. And because of this, Paul refers to Christians as children of the light, children of the day. If you're identified as a child of the light or a child of the day, your identity comes from being spiritually awake. When we're spiritually awake, we see things how they are. We know what's spiritually real and true, and we have the capacity to respond to those truths. Paul wrote, let us not sleep as others do. What does it mean to be spiritually asleep? It means we're oblivious to the truth. And when we're oblivious to the truth, 
we can't respond to it. So Paul said, let us keep awake. If we're looking forward to the Lord's return, we will be spiritually aware so that we know the Lord is coming. We will be spiritually awake so that we can respond to his coming. And the final thing we must do to live looking forward to Christ's return is to be alert. We will be alert as a response to what we know. Be alert so that you're ready for the Lord's return. Read with me 1 Thessalonians 5, starting back in verse 6. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Since we belong to the day, let us be sober. Sober-mindedness, clear thinking, and unclouded judgment uh, is imperative to Christian living. One of the worst nights in my life ever was working in a restaurant uh, alongside a drunk woman, a drunk person who was my coworker. And as orders piled up, and as we were getting behind on this busy night, instead of making progress, we just moved backwards. Uh, this person kept making mess after mess after mess. Her mind was not in a place to work. And that's why drunkenness is a sin. Thinking spiritually, it impairs our minds from doing the Lord's work. Ben Gieselbach wrote in an article earlier this year on drunkenness, maintaining your sobriety is one of the most critical elements of the Christian life. The sober man digs into scripture. He considers the long-term spiritual consequences of his actions rather than the short-term physical pleasures. He labors over decisions because holiness is hard mental work. He weighs his actions and doesn't act hastily without the thought. He refuses to go with the crowd or subscribe to the philosophy of the day. In contrast, you don't need to use your brain much to sin. You don't need to use your brain much to sin. If you're drunk, you're not going to be able to do your job. If you're sober, there's nothing in the way. You should have no problem. Paul writes, having put on faith, love, and hope, since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on faith and love as a breastplate and as a helmet, the hope of our salvation. These are our work clothes. This is what we wear to live for the Lord. Faith, hope, and love are often mentioned in tandem together in Paul's writings, and they should be seen worn by every Christian. And Paul relates each of these virtues to an honor to a piece of armor. Faith and love are a, a breastplate, and the hope of salvation is a helmet. The illustration of armor here represents a soldier on guard. And that reminds us elsewhere of when Paul talks about, uh, Paul likens Christian virtues to armor. Recall Paul's writing on the armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6. What is the value of Christian armor? Paul answers in verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. The armor of God equips us to stand against the schemes of the devil. And if you look at another familiar verse in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, this verse brings together the importance of sober-mindedness and resisting the devil. 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober-minded, be watchful, or your translation may say, be alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. When we're equipped with the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet of the hope of salvation, we are clothed for the day of the Lord. Like a soldier, we are on guard 
We are alert, ready at any moment for Christ's return. And this is true because we are sober-minded and we are equipped in doing the Lord's work. Faith, hope, and love are present in our lives. Faith, hope, and love are present in our lives. So having studied what we have just in these verses, having studied Paul's words to the Thessalonians, we can heartily make this resolution pretty easy and straightforward. Let's live looking forward to the Lord's return. There are plenty of things we can look forward to here on earth, and there are good things to look forward to on earth. But there's nothing more fulfilling to a Christian than the comfort of knowing Christ will return. Read with me the final few verses here in this section of Scripture. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 9 through 11. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one, one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. Whether Jesus returns in this lifetime or 2,000 years from now, Christians have comfort knowing that we will live with him, with Jesus in heaven. And for the Thessalonians, this was especially encouraging. They learned their past brothers and sisters, uh, the ones who were already asleep, uh, they'd get to reunite with them. And we share that same comfort. Christians don't dread or dismiss the day of the Lord. We live our lives eager in every moment for the Lord to return. Until then, we relish fellowship in Christ's church. We encourage one another and build one another up as we see the day drawing near. As the song says, this is not the invitation song we're going to sing this morning, but it's one we do sing often. There's a bright day coming, but its brightness will only come to them that love the Lord. The day of the Lord will be the best day ever for Christians but it'll be the worst day ever for those who are not in Christ. The knowledge of the Lord's return should be terrifying to those who are not faithful Christians. You can't afford to procrastinate your faith. If you'd like to become a Christian this morning and share in the faith, hope, and love that we have, you can repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. That would make us, uh, nothing would make us happier this morning than to see you become a Christian. We want you to be as excited as we are for the return of the Lord. If you're a Christian who has not been faithful, you're not on guard, we want to encourage you and build you up as you determine to repent. If there's any way we can help you with your spiritual needs, Come to the front while we stand and sing. When Jesus comes.